Well, ladies and gents, this is Unbiased History, the Roman Monarchy. We saw the first video of it, Unbiased History, the Roman Mythology. In that, we saw uh, how Rome came to be from Troy to Carthage, Carthage to Rome, how Romulus and Remus created Rome. Uh, this guy, Dover Hattie, uh, the channel guy, uh, distorts lots of facts. Some, com uh, some of are completely false and completely opposite. But that's the point of it. It's a satire. It's not complete history. His own channel says, look at that, a channel not for learning history, but to indulge the sheer madness of it. So it's for the entertainment purpose. So it's just awesome the way he puts together thing. He talks a bit fast, but then I learned that only first two, three or videos are like that. Then he starts to make it slow paced. So he talks too fast. That's kind of hard to comprehend sometimes. But it's all, all over his quality of videos, the way he creates, uh, his sound, the way he narrates is just great. Uh, this is make of, you know, the, this looks like he's going to be really big in the future. He's going to have a million subscribers. Right now he has 100,000 subscribers. I feel like in the future he's going to have a million subscribers. He's really good. So, uh, let's watch the next video, The Roman Monarchy. On the 14th of April, 753 BC, the dream of Rome first took form. After a lifetime of injustices, Rome was now stood as the last of his people and Rome's first king. His priority was to create institutions from which the city could thrive. The monarchy would be assisted by the Roman Senate, assembled by all Trojan descended Romans, now senators, set to guide and elect the kings of the city. Romulus pondered heavily on how he could make Rome better to live in than Troy, only to realize he had already done it, there being no woman in the city and all, for the gods invented women to test the infinite patience of the Trojans, but the Romans were seemingly freed of that burden. Instantly, the news of paradise on earth spread through Italy. The previous kings from Abalonga had put much effort into partially civilizing some of the local barbarians, and when those heard of the news, they immigrated by the thousands. Romulus was at first unsure what to do about them, especially how they brought their wives with them. His best friend, Hostus Hostilius, advised having them all killed. It was good advice, but he had another solution in mind. He divided the populations into two classes, the patricians, the original fathers of the nation, and the plebs, the masses made to work the farms, serve as fodder infantry, and the most feminine ones as Roman sex slaves. As for the woman, they served as breeding cows to ensure the future generations. The true bisexual heaven. It was Damn. Rome's first golden age. Things were going so well, Romulus threw a massive party, inviting all his partially civilized neighbors to show them the greatness of Rome, among them the Sabines. The party was going well, until some Sabine woman glanced at Romulus and his patrician friends, seeing such sexy men so happy as bachelors, they couldn't help but urge to ruin them. The plan was hatched. They conspired to get all the men drunk, then dragged the Romans out, raped them while unconscious, got all pregnant, then woke up their Sabine husbands, saying they had been kidnapped, only to wake up the Romans, ordering them to defend the mothers of their future children. The Roman? Okay, I don't know this history, but I'm 100% sure this is completely opposite of what actually happened. I'm pretty sure that uh, these Romans uh, kidnapped these women and raped them. I'm pretty sure that's what the history says. There is no way that happened. So this is completely opposite. This is going to be hard for me to understand lots of part of this, because since I don't know Roman history that much, watching this is going to be hard, because lots of it is completely opposite. It's, it's for satire purposes, but still it's going to be hard to know what is true and what is not. Bound by honor, crushed the Sabines in battle, but granted them mercy, even integrating them as citizens. Despite the Sabine woman's cry for more blood, they were now their in laws after all. Barbarian woman, everybody. No evil greater than that. Even so, Romulus only lamented having lost his best friend Hostus in the battle. Seeking a resolution, Romulus allowed the Sabine king to co rule the city with him, but thankfully the fool died in a stupid ritual or whatever. But he wasn't the only one whose days were numbered. After decades of rule, Romulus had grown wary. There is only so much injustice, strategy, and malevolence a man can take. One day, while inspecting his soldiers, a huge storm emerged, taking Romulus with it, ascending him to live with the gods as a reward for his great deeds. Romulus's legacy in Rome was vast, but perhaps his greatest contribution was the teaching of no matter how shit, painful and maddening things get, never give up on your duty. A philosophy that served the Romans well when dealing with their wives. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it didn't help at all. In this spirit, we enter the post-Romulus kings, six in total, only <laughs> I'm just kidding, it didn't help at all. In this Blast of fortune on screen. Ramon is on the woman free era, explain why plebs how to exist, get to the golden age, Romulus party, parties ruined by women, tell of the rape by the Sabine women, bring the sweet release of death to Romulus. <laughs> to do list, okay. 
spirit, we entered the post Romulus kings, six in total, only two of which were Roman, and only one of which I liked. So let's blast through it. Seeking to appease the Sabines, the Senate elected Numa to be the second king, a complete religious lunatic, but a peaceful one at that, being the tool through which the gods detailed how they wished to be worshipped. Plenty can be traced back to Numa, the Temple of Janus, the Cult of Terminus, and even Saturnalia. If you're a Christian, it means Roman Christmas, so that's neat. After Numa died of boredom at the age of 80, Tullus Hostilius was elected king, the son of Holus, and a total Chad. Simply put, he admired Romulus as his hero. Hating barbarians with the fury of a billion sons, he waged war on them at every opportunity, even coming to blows with Alba Longa, long since taken over by barbarians, again. Seeking to avoid much bloodshed between sister cities, the dispute was settled in a duel between three Romans against three Albans. Having lost, Alba Longa was made a Roman vessel, a deal which the barbarian king immediately broke. Furious at the betrayal, Tullus personally led an invasion of the city, killing the barbarian king and ending his tyranny. Imitation really is the greatest form of flattery. Thankfully, he was also a pragmatist, taking the remaining non barbarian population of Alba Longa and integrating it into Rome. Tullus would spend all his remaining years cleansing Italy of as many barbarians as he could, crushing Fidenai, Veii, and rebelling Sabines in battle, to his immense pleasure. Such was Tullus' hatred for barbarians, he forgot to provide the appropriate yearly offerings to Jupiter. For being far too focused in his bloodlust, Jupiter mortally struck Tullus with lightning. With his last words, <laughs> Tullus lamented having forgotten his religious duties and that he hadn't killed more barbarians. The fourth elected king was Ancus Martius, grandson of Numa, and a proper admirer. The way he writes the dialogues, it feels like this. <laughs> All this, the, the way he writes it, it feels like this is Family Guy episode of, you know, Rome history. <laughs> Fuck off, and Jupiter is like... <laughs> of his Trojan ancestors, managing to rescue some of their ancient lost manuscripts. With them, he kickstarted Rome's love for architectural wonders, his greatest achievement being the extension of Rome to the port city of Ostia, connected with a series of aqueducts. Bringing such prosperity to Rome... Anchor Damn, that is just next building aqueducts, man. Uh, obviously this is set so he's gonna gloss past it, but I'm pretty, I, I want to find some really good history, accurate history video, like how Epic History TV does it, but for Rome. The aqueducts and all is just next level things what they did. They survived even now. That's just ridiculous. Our even best architecture lasts only few centuries. They are still there even after millennia, man. Because lowered his guard, committing the greatest mistake of any king until then, trusting a barbarian. An immigrant, rich, half Greek, half Etruscan, socialist barbarian. Yep, checks everything. His name was Tarquinius, and mere days after being named the regent of his two sons, the king died. Using Angus's favor to get the permission of the senate, he kicked the princes out of Rome, seizing power for himself. Rome was now ruled by a barbarian. May Jupiter have mercy. Not long after, the princes sent an assassin to kill Tarquinius, shoving an axe into his head, Trotsky style. A socialist death to a socialist rat. Shame that his barbarian wife was there when it happened, covering the situation for long enough until her relative Servius Tullius took over. Now, it could have been much worse, as Servius Tullius was secretly one of those barbarians who had been forcefully civilized by then. He sought to prove to the Roman people that at least some barbarians were able to repent. As king, he conducted a census of the city, assigning taxes and positions more fairly, actively defending the city from actual barbarians, personally invented the concept of a century, and later on building the Servian walls, further protecting the people. So concerned was Servius to live up to the Roman standards of a king that he did everything in his power to secure prosperity, even giving his daughters in marriage to Tarquinius's sons. Tarquinius the Younger, later known as Tiberius, and Tullia Minor, a basic cunt. Both being the unrepentant barbarians that they were, they murdered their spouses, got married, and started plotting to usurp the king. Hearing about the rumors about Superbus and Tullia, Servius went to the Senate, finding Superbus sitting at the throne. He had Servius seized by his bribed plebs, murdering the king and throwing his body out to the stairs and into the streets, where his own daughter trampled over his corpse, unlawfully proclaiming Superbus the new king of Rome. Now you believe what, what I said about barbarian woman? This trope isn't going anywhere. So now we have Superbus seizing power by force. Rolling with an iron fist, purging those who question him, using indiscriminate violence and oppression on innocents, you know, barbaric stuff. Fast forward in a few years, and Superbus used Rome's strength to claim leadership of the Barbarian Latin League, using their combined armies in a campaign against other barbarians, in an effort to make Romans forget that he is one himself. After endless battles for no good goal, the Romans were just sick of it all. Three generations of barbarian rule will do that for you. Yeah, service was okay, I know, but the people yearned for true Romans to retake power. In their infinite patience, the patricians played along. Until this happened. This creature is Sextus, Superbus's son. Not only was he an insult, good for nothing, fat, ugly barbarian retard, but he had this autistic wish to revenge Damn. his barbarian ancestors from when their princess was kidnapped by the vile Trojan prince. Yet another barbarian lie that has persisted through the ages. Go watch Troy if you want more indoctrination. For his revenge, he chose to target the most beautiful, intelligent, and virtuous patrician woman of all. Luckily for him, he managed to eavesdrop on his cousin Colatinus while discussing who the best woman of Rome was, learning of his patrician wife, Lucrezia. And the thing with Lucrezia was that she was able to transcend her female 
material limitations in such a way as to employ all the virtues her Roman ancestors fought for, yet remain in the height of feminine beauty. Convinced of his target, Sextus sneaked into Collatinus' tent, finding Lucrezia doing her womanly chores. At first he tried to seduce her, which failed, then he tried rape, which also failed, then personal threat, another failure. Lucrezia was at least 10,000 leagues above Sextus in every way. Nothing could break her Roman spirit, the but then it clicked. After thousands of years of Darwinian evolution, the barbarians had finally adapted to their civilized rivals, figuring out the best way to hurt a Roman is to target the people closest to them. In her case, he threatened to tell everyone that she had betrayed Collatinus with a slave. Lucrezia couldn't let his husband be humiliated like that. With no other choice, she conceded. The crimes committed on that tent compare only to the rape of Troy itself. I can't draw what happened for legal reasons, so let your imagination run wild. Damn. <laughs> Ugh. The day after the act, <laughs> Lucrezia was a broken shadow of her former self, but oh only on God. the outside. Deep down, her fiery virtue still raged with a thirst for justice. Dressed in all black, she got in front of a crowd of her fellow Romans, giving the speech of her life about how Sextus had defiled her, ousting the unspeakable horrors she had suffered. As a final sacrifice, she sudokud herself for all to see, calling for the sons and daughters of Rome to rise and save their city, as she dropped dead to everyone's horror. The death of Rome's greatest woman enraged both patricians and plebs alike. United in revolt against the monarchy, they were led by what became known as the Zero of Triumvirate. Collatinus, Lucretia's husband, Publius, a famous patrician, and none other than Lucius Brutus himself, then captain of the guard. Brutus personally led the revolt to the Senate, dragging the vile Sextus to the feet of the senators, telling them of the rape of Lucretia, the indignation of the people, and how the monarchy had been destroyed by barbarians. After years of concealed disgust, the senators unanimously agreed, proclaiming the end of the monarchy and the death penalty for the barbarian royal family. Now lacking a governing system, Brutus and the senators wisely agreed Romulus's wishes would be best for fulfilled if Rome were to be led by meritocratic selection of patricians. And so, the Roman Republic was born, the first and best democratic institution in history, led by the first two elected consuls, Brutus and Collatinus. Once news of the revolt reached Superbus, his army instantly defected, marching back home to join the Republic. Desperate to retain power, Superbus sent spies to Rome, disguised as ambassadors. They approached the senators, trying to bribe them for support, but the patricians denied their advances, reporting them immediately for bribery. Some barbarians say Brutus' own sons accepted the bribes, <laughs> as if barbarian lies permit society no matter the era. Now truly desperate, Superbus let his barbarity completely take him over, riding north to the Etruscan lands, promising the local hordes that if they followed him they would loot the greatest city on earth. Amassing a huge barbarian force, Superbus marched on Rome. Seeing the scale of the threat, Brutus wondered if Collatinus, being part barbarian, would come to betray the Republic. Recognizing his own weakness, Collatinus abdicated, going into exile, and having Publius take over from him as consul. At the Battle of Silva Arcia, Superbus's barbarian horde clashed against the Romans, their overwhelming numbers causing many casualties. Brutus, leading from the front, countless savages, but being overwhelmed nonetheless. Seeing their commander sacrifice himself for Rome, the Romans pushed back, eventually routing the hordes and claiming victory. Superbus managed to escape, fleeing to the Latin League, gathering their hordes for yet another battle, only to be crushed a second time. He then fled to Cumae, where he finally died, thank the gods. Rome had once more been saved, but at the cost of some of its greatest heroes. As the consul, Publius, now Publicola, made sure to return Brutus' corpse to Rome, where they celebrated the victory with the first triumph of the Republic, proclaiming aloud Rome would never again be ruled by barbarians. Ah, uh, if only. But all is well when it ends well, and when barbarians learn their place under the Roman boot. Next time, we'll retell the tales of the early republic. Holy sh he talks way too fast. Lots of things just glossed over, but I get the gist of it. <laughs> it's weird, man. One guy, you know, did unspeakable things to a woman. Then the power of just, you know, publicity, the power of, you know, speaking in front of people. She just went in front of people and said, oh, that this is what happened to me, and then killed herself. That caused the republic. That caused the overthrow of monarchy. That's heavy, man. Uh, it, when you when you are told that one woman was enough, one insignificant woman was enough to you know throw an entire monarchy of the past just because she went in front of public and said what happened to her, that's unheard of. So that is that is heavy thing to see, man. So now the Roman Republic is the next video. I hope he stopped speaking this fast, man. Lots of things just glossed over me. I've never reacted to a video where most of the time I'm just looking like what the what what just happened? What just happened? So lots of things just went over my head, but I understood lots of things too. <laughs> man, oh man. Alright, if you like reaction, please don't forget to like and subscribe.